I'd like to welcome Minister Rabbit to the House. We're on item number 47, motion 8, regarding public debate on issues of free speech. Senator Sapoan. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Cahirlik. And, um, uh, uh, sorry? Ten minutes. Thank you very much. Um, and welcome uh, to the Chamber, uh, Minister, and, and thank you uh, so much for ag agreeing to take the motion. Um, your statements on, on the issue have been very helpful uh, to date, Minister, and our debate today, I think, indicates that much more needs to be said and done so that in the first place, homophobia someday will be wiped out of Irish culture and society. Um, and uh, I know there's been a lot of debate on how we define homophobia. Um, I have here the e European Parliament's definition of homophobia, and I say, why wouldn't we accept the European Parliament's definition of homophobia, which is a wide continuum. Colm O'Gorman, I think, first pointed it out to us recently. Uh, homophobia defined as an irrational fear of and aversion to homosexuality, manifesting itself every from every, in different forms, such as hate speech, all the way from hate speech to uh, discrimination and violation of the principle of equality and unjustified and unreasonable limitations of rights. Why wouldn't we have that wide understanding and definition of homophobia? So I think more needs to be said and done in order to wipe that out of Irish culture and society. But in second place, and that's maybe perhaps what we're here for today, that I think political leadership can ensure the debate on marriage equality is conducted in a fair, open, and impartial manner. Impartial means without prejudice, and that raises the bar very high. I think Rory O'Neill has done a great service to our country and to wider global LGBT and other human rights movements when exercising his absolute and unrestricted right to hold opinions without interference. This is a right uh, guaranteed under the Civil and Political Rights Covenant, International Covenant, and Ireland has obliged itself to uphold this. And when he further exercised his human right to freedom of expression, that's also in the Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, both on the Saturday Night Show and on the stage of the Abbey Theatre, his fundamental call, his fundamental noble call to all of us is to eradicate our prejudices and to change oppressive social, legal, religious, and cultural systems. Minister, silencing voices against homophobia violates human rights, as barrister Brian Barrington pointed out. Why is this the case? Well, I think it really boils down to two words, human dignity. And no doubt, all sides of this house agree with the first lines of the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that recognition of the inherent dignity and of equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in our world. The genuine experience of dignity is a quintessential ingredient for the empowerment of every human to lead the life they wish to choose. And I paraphrase here words of the great philosopher and economist Amartya Sen in his pioneering work, Development as Freedom. Professor Sen uses this concept of all humans living the life they wish to choose as not only integral to eradicating world poverty, but also as being core to the rights of all minorities. A nation's development does not happen unless all of its people are free. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they are going somewhere. Because a man can't ride your back unless it is bent. As a young lesbian, I did not always carry a genuine experience of human dignity. Indeed, I often felt shame. Shame for my feelings, shame for my actions, and shame for who I was discovering myself to be. And I wonder now, is that a similar feeling of shame to those in this country who were out of work, to those who left school early, to those in prison, to those who beg on our streets, or to our young, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people? But what I do know is that shame does bend your back. And what I do know is that shame is never generated from within. It develops as others, 
who are not like you or others who possess more resources or abilities than you suspect that your difference is deviant. And I think it develops also when you run up against laws and systems fashioned by religious and state leaders that keep you outside the mainstream of social, cultural, and economic opportunities or institutions or human worth or human worthiness. Martha Nussbaum, one of the foremost philosopher lawyers of our time, calls it the politics of disgust. Minister, international human rights standards value free speech over being spoken of offensively. International human rights law sets a high bar before speech can be considered to be of such a degree of offensiveness that the state must prohibit it. And the more serious the issue in public debate, the higher is the bar. The UN Human Rights Committee says that, and I'm gonna quote them here, the mere fact that forms of expression are considered insulting to a public figure is not sufficient to justify the imposition of penalties. And when it's reflecting on and interpreting another part of the, the covenant on civil and political rights that says we need also to respect the reputation of others, that that must be taken into account, it says, and I quote them again, the UN Human Rights Committee, it says that it may never be invoked, that respecting the re reputation of others, it may never be invoked as justification for the muzzling of any advocacy of human rights. I feel a chill as many others do, and so we need a thaw. I welcome the steps that you as Minister for Communications have outlined today, and I look forward to what you have to say to us this afternoon, uh, Minister. And um, I guess uh, I'm going to urge you, I'm going to identify some things I think that you and the government could enact additional measures so that our Republic genuinely values freedom and tolerance. In my view, we need, and this is not an exhaustive list, and nor is it sequential, I think we need RTE to appear before the Communications Committee to outline its approach to libel complaints, and that RTE subsequently issues and disseminates guidelines regarding freedom of expression and defamation. These guidelines should be given to all who go on our national airwaves. I think this would be a prime way for the state broadcaster to fulfill its public service role. And I also think that the process of devising such guidelines would no doubt go a long way towards assessing whether or not our laws can adequately protect the human right to free speech. It would be extremely, extremely useful, I think, also to have our politicians in exchange with RTE on what are needed in such guidelines. And I do agree, Minister, with your dull statement, though, that it is not desirable for the committee to become embroiled in the management of particular claims. Uh, secondly, I think that we also need a freedom of expression audit of both the Broadcasting Act and the Defamation Act. I do welcome the fact that you will consider making amendments to the Broadcasting Act. I think that's very constructive. Um, along with other commentators, I'm wondering, I'm not certain that amending Section 39 of the Broadcasting Act, as you have noted, from something broadcast that may be reasonably regarded as causing offense to something that avoids causing undue offense. I'm not sure that will make much difference. The degree of harm, which undue I think refers to, is already part of the test of reasonableness in the act in a later section. And freedom of expression is the norm, and any restriction on it must be the exception. I know also that it is not, while it is not under your remit, I do think that the, that the Defamation Act could be reviewed as well. For example, the Defamation Act, while it includes a defense of honest opinion for the one accused, this defense may require too strong a factual threshold for opinions as it is currently in the law. I think the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission, though they're not fully established, and this is a problem too, I think though they would be best placed to do this work. And indeed, it seems to me that if we had a designated Human Rights Committee, this would be the best parliamentary place to receive such work. Anyhow, thirdly, and as I said, it's not exhaustive, but I, I think we also need policies, laws, and resources to ensure that our schools are homophobia-free zones. Minister Quinn is committed to this, I know, and I, for one, stand up against homophobic bullying, a hugely important campaign being run by, belong to, supported by other groups, marriage equality, tenure, transparency, Benefits. coming to the end. But in my view, much more needs to be done, and getting rid of Section 37.1 from our Employment Equality Act 
would be a massive catalyst to usher in a new era of freedom in our schools. To conclude, I stand here as a married woman, married to another woman, Anne Louise Gilligan. I have traveled beyond the valley of shame and fear because her forever love beckoned. That's what marriage equality means. And that's why I think we must get this right. And it is in our power to do so.